said that we're going to change the, the structure of the day. So instead of a one-hour session and beautifully prepared slides, we've got 15 minutes. And we're now going to do those slides in Pecha Kucha fashion, i.e. fast. So if you're not awake yet after the lunchtime shift, here we go. So in essence, we're going to talk about three things. Well, four, because everything's changed so fast. Firstly, about chimpanzees and baboons. Secondly, we're going to have a session about maths, which you'll all love. Then we're going to talk about an interesting is the major feature of most alternative organization structures that are considered to be great, although that they're very rare and they don't tend to last. Why is that? And third is why do organizations decay? So hang on to your hats. Let's talk about chimpanzees and bonobos first. Chimpanzees and bonobos are genetically exactly the same almost. They're two species or subspecies of the same animal. One has got a patriarchal structure based on kicking each other. The other one has got a matriarchal uh, structure based on shagging each other. Totally different structures of society. They are both able to collaborate fully. They are both highly efficient in their environments. They are both able to use tools. So the first lesson we can get from pre-human organization structure, you can either have a classic hierarchical, let's be bastard structure, or you can have a wonderful hippie structure, let's all love everybody. They both work. There is no golden rule. The second structure thing is to talk about transforming, transforming baboon organizations. In uh, East Africa uh, a while ago, uh, the alpha males all died by eating cholera-infected garbage uh, near a village because um, only alpha males got to eat the garbage, leaving the entire baboon society with beta males and the females. What do you think happened next? Well, interesting enough, the society became very peaceful. That, that baboon society became collaborative and peaceful, all these good things. That was one interesting. The second interesting thing is it sustained that over three generations. So there's been no reversion to the mean in that society. So that's, that's kind of fascinating. So these are pre-human organizational structures. So let's talk about new organization structure models. Here's a classic consultant's matrix, a two by two. When we look at what's gone before, you've either got the traditional hierarchy, which has got lots of layers, uh, lots of structure, and what we've kind of seen working over the last 20 years is small work groups that tend to be the sort of flat work group, but they tend to be quite small, quite unstructured. In the middle, you've tended to have hierarchies becoming flatter to try and be more flexible. You've seen uh, work groups trying to become more hybridized, i.e. work groups that are linked together or some, so on and so forth. What you're now seeing is huge numbers of experts su suggesting things like holacracy and hierarchies and so on. They tend to be try and be low, low, less layers, but they all seem to be structured in various ways. So holacracy is actually extremely structured if you ever read the way it, it works and comes from a technology called sociocracy in the 50s, which, which fell out of favor. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So we start to understand, well, what makes these things work or not work? Can we predict them? So we start to look at the maths and the history. Firstly, there have been flexible hierarchies in history. Roman legions, the French, Napoleon's military corps, the Catholic Church are, were extremely effective, extremely flexible systems. They tended to have the basics of everything they needed to do within them. They were very modular, they could split, they could break, they could move around. Terrorist organizations are also highly effective. Guerrillas in Spain in the 1800s in the Napoleonic Wars were organized the same way as they are now. They're, they're, very, they're cells, but they tend to be able to react against a structure. Once they get into power, they tend, not, they tend to fall apart and they tend to build structures of their own. And those structures look suspiciously like the old structures over through. Uh, if you've ever read Animal Farm, that's it in, 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 uh, in, in embryo. So the other thing we found is when we looked at all these alternative structures, there's all, they're always coming up, you know, from movements back in the medieval times. The question is, they all tend to have brief lives and nobody adopts them. So if they were so wonderful, why do they die and why does nobody else take them up? So that was interesting. So there's only one way to find this out, and that's to look at the maths. Firstly, there's Dunbar's numbers. Dunbar, Robin Dunbar, looked at primates and then humans and how they work. And what they find is that the deeper the relationship we have, um, the fewer people you can have in it, because unfortunately we are, we are constrained in our mental capacity. And as you put more people into the, uh, the, the system you've got to work with, we are able to have a, a less and less deep relationship with, me and, with them. So if you try and have deep relationships with large numbers of people, you've got overkill. And that, that's kind of what email overload looks like. You know? Email with CC list is a deep and meaningful relationship with everybody else in your company. That's called 600 emails a day, and that's why we collapse. And social media is the same. As Janet said, in our research, we're finding companies that are succeeding with these social platforms are now finding the amount of messaging that's coming is huge. And you're now having people say, well, how can I, how can I concentrate that? So that's maths one. Maths two is network structure. You've got two extremes, full hierarchy. That it's actually very efficient. There's very few links in the system. But it's got quite a high distance between the people's in the links. The full mesh, where everybody's totally connected up, is 
we're all in it together. Lots and lots of links. Lots and lots of very low mean distance. The problem is when you scale these things, um, there are trade-offs. Hierarchies are very simple, they're very scalable, they're very efficient, they're very economic, but they're very rigid. And as, as an engineer, I know that the, the counterpoint of efficiency, uh, sorry, the counterpoint of resilience and redundancy is cost. So full mesh tend to be very resilient, fully redundant, but they cost more to run. Uh, they're easy to reach everybody, but they're easy to swamp everybody. So somewhere between these two extremes is probably going to be the answer going forward. The other thing about them is when you scale full mesh networks, you wind up with this, the Dunbar problem. The, the network effect which makes network businesses so effective is the same problem that blows our brains when we scale organizations that are structured that way. They don't scale properly. That's why most um, heterarchical networks things are still small. They, they reach a scale and they fall over. So what do we think is going to happen? We think there'll be a happy medium. They'll, the term fishnet is sometimes used. It's a, what it means is a limited number of connections, not quite as small as a hierarchy, but not as fully connected as the full mesh. And within them, there'll be little. You can run little heterarchical pods running um, or, or, or cells. So that looks like mathematically what is the, the system that is most likely to be the median. If I go back, it's the little blue line just above the red line in terms of the way it scales in terms of links when you when you run it. So that's what the maths is telling us. There's also a dreaded thing called transaction costs. This is Ronald Coase in the 30s. In a nutshell, the easier it is to do business, the less likely I, have, I am to have those people in my company. I don't need them. And what's happening with modern technology is they're reducing the transaction costs, so it's less and less necessary to have all the functions in a business that you used to have. That's why you're seeing movement of the whole contractor business and so on. Companies are downsizing, using all sorts of ways to reduce that. So we looked at case studies, what has worked sustainably in the organization. The first one you see is John Lewis. It's been going for 100 years and more. It's been seen decade after decade as a great place to be. They have a very simple trick. They've got a hierarchy, but it's quite nice to structure. Stores are quite interesting. They have a, a maximum size. So I think whether it's within the, the parameters of John Lewis, but they never grew to massive super factories. That Each store is a, a unit, if you like. It's a Dunbar unit. They also used employee share ownership. Everybody has a stake in the business. And that everybody who studied this company over the years has found that that is culture trans, is, transforms the culture of the business. That's what differentiates it between and every other department store. So that thing we know, that is sustainable. That is a 100-year sustainable model. The second one is Toyota's production system. It's got two bits to it. One is the respect for people and teamwork, which you see if you look at the way they do cell production and all the rest, which is what the human human resources people. The second thing, though, is they have an extremely powerful method of, we could use the term continuous reinvention for the modern age, but what Toyota absolutely focus on is once you've, they call it removing rocks from the stream. Once you've removed the rocks that bring the stream level down, you then go for the next series of rocks. And they have a whole lot of techniques, including Kaizen, which is good change, or what we, which is continual, or Genchi Gunbutsu, which means go and see for yourself, i.e. management by walking around or just actually finding out what's really going on, being involved with the business. Another one which is every single case study on new organization structures uses W.L. Gore. And the reason for that is about the only new organization structure that's lasted a long time. And it does all those things. But you also have to look beyond them. What's under W.L. Gore? It's, it's a high value product. It can run a higher cost organization structure because it's got a high value, low margin product. The second thing is a family business. You can do things in family, or as I was talking to AO earlier on from PostShip. The organization has to allow long-term planning. It doesn't have to be a family business, but if it's got a short-term mindset, they can, it's very difficult to run this way. And when they say no chains of command, it's more accurate to say it as an animal farm. Some, some animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. There are hierarchies, even in totally hierarchical systems. Uh, Valve runs a software product. This is from the Valve employee manual of how to work. Step one, come up with a bright idea. Step two, tell a co-worker about it. Step three, work on it together. And step four, ship it. The minute you do not doing computerized digital work, the, the difference between step three, work on it together, and step four, ship it is called a factory. If you don't have a digital factory called a computer, this gets hard. And then the other one we're watching with great interest is Zappos, which is using the holacracy system to effectively transform a, a rigid hierarchical uh, structure into a series of cells. And it's quite interesting to see where this is going, because it's, it's, an, it's an experiment as we're going. It, we, you, you're seeing the news coming out on a day-by-day -day basis. And the news is going two ways. Some things are working really well. Some things are not working well at all. And I think when the smoke clears, it'll be a very interesting study. And then the last thing, whoops, 
is the three P's of organizational ossification. Firstly, the Peter Principle. In any organization, everybody is uh, promoted to their own uh, uh, level of incompetence. So eventually, all organizations are full of incompetent people. The second is Parkinson's Law, which is uh, work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So an official always wants to multiply subordinates, not rivals. It's an anti-collaborative manifesto, really. And then the last one is Purnell's Law, which any organization eventually works to uh, sustain itself rather than for the good of the people in it. And that really is to start the argument. <laughs>